All right, uh, you should have uh, pre-read Romans chapter 2, verses 17 through 29. If you have not, you'll be a little bit behind the eight ball, but that's okay. We'll go through it together in our series for Unashamed. Today we're talking about the heart circumcised, but we're going to stand and we're going to read our, our verses together out of Romans chapter 1, our, our uh, theme verse. So if you would stand with me for the Unashamed uh, series, we'll start right here, verse 16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes, first to the Jew, then to the Gentile. For in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith from first to last, just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. Praise the Lord. You may be seated. So that's our theme, obviously, uh, We'll be in this for a while. It could be the end of the year, or it could be next year before we get done. Who knows? I am in no rush. So don't worry about that. There'll be nothing better for the Lord to return while I'm preaching the book of Romans. Praise the Lord. So uh, Paul wrote this towards the end of his life, uh, about 57. He was on his third and final missionary journey. Uh, He's writing to to the people in Rome. He's not in Rome currently. He's by Athens. Athens, pardon me. He's in Athens, or right next to Athens in a little town called Corinth, and he's about to go to Rome, and this is the letter that he writes in advance, preparing them for his arrival, so that there's no, nothing ambiguous about his arrival. Uh, they all know what they're getting themselves into. Today, we're going to talk about this. This is uh, one of the largest hinges uh, that I, I could find, and the thing about a hinge is uh, things open and close based on this hinge. And so as we move our way through today, we're going to talk about a spiritual hinge on which the door of heaven swings. That's going to be vital for us. Uh, It will determine whether or not you have victory or defeat in your life. It will determine whether or not the doors of heaven are open for you or they're closed. This is how vital this is. So let's pay attention as we get started with Romans chapter 2, beginning at the 17th verse. Now, uh, I'm going to try to divide the remainder of this chapter into two parts. Now, if you remember... What we've done up to this point is Paul's pretty much dropped the hammer on everybody, right? Wrath 1.0, Wrath 2.0, we we know where he's going with all this, right? Well, he has one more person to drop the hammer on, and that's the self-righteous Jews, okay? So we've gone through the Gentiles, we've gone through the Christians, now he's about ready to drop the hammer on the Jews. And then about two-thirds of the way through this morning, he'll finally come to the hinge by which the doors of heaven swing. And if you're ready, say amen. amen. All right, so that's, that's kind of our light outline for this morning. So let's get into wrath 3.0, just for a minute. Verse 17, now you who call yourself Jew, right? I've already warned you. We've talked to the Gentile, to the Christian, and now he's going to address the Jews. Now you, if you call yourself a Jew, if you rely on the law... And you're prideful, you boast in God. So he's moving from addressing Gentiles and uh, Romans and Christians to Jews. He accuses them right here, right from the get. You're relying on yourself, you're relying on the law, and you're prideful. You're relying on yourself, you're relying on your heritage. And what's important about that is, he goes all the way back to Abraham, So he says, okay, you think the law, you're going all the way back to your lineage, which is Abraham. Abraham is about 2000 BC, Moses 1500 BC. So he's he's predating the law, which they lived by, by another 500 years by invoking Father Abraham. You with me? All right, so here we go. Abraham in Hebrews 11, verse number eight, by faith, Abraham called to God, place where he would later receive his inheritance, and he obeyed and he went, even though he did not know where he was going. And by faith, he made his home in the promised land, like a stranger in a foreign country. He lived in tents, as did Isaac and Jacob and their heirs of the same promise. Verse 10, for he was looking forward to a city with foundations, whose architect and builder is God. And by faith, even Sarah, who was past childbearing age, was enabled to bear children because she considered him faithful who had made made the promise. I love the fact that you don't have to be as faithful because God is faithful. Even when you're unfaithful, God is faithful. He's made a promise and he'll keep it. And let me just say, it's rarely when you want it, pardon me, it's rarely when I want it, 
I always want it much faster. He made the promise, hey, we're going to Disney World. Now, 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 no, next summer. Right? You ever do that to a five-year-old? I, I pity you if you've done that. You have no peace. This is how God promises you and me. Here's the promise. Now wait. Oh, wait for it. So at this point, the Jews have been Jews for 2,000 years. That's a lot of history up to this point because we've got another 2,000 years that we've lived since then. We're talking zero. We're talking the birth of Jesus. We're talking first century. For 2,000 years prior to that, they've rested in the fact that they are Abraham's seed, part of the covenant that God made with Abraham. Verse 18, if you, who, who, if you know his will and approve what is superior because you are instructed, that's an important word, instructed, katekeo, sounds an awful lot like the word catechism, katekeo, you're instructed meaning to inform, to instruct, to teach, by, instructed by the law. So not only did they feel themselves, the Jews, to be superior, they were superior to everyone, particularly if they weren't Jew. And here's how they saw themselves. I love this, verse 19 and 20. If you're convinced that you are a guide for those who are blind, a light to those who are in the dark, an instructor to the foolish, a teacher to, I mean, a guide, a light, an instructor, a teacher. Wow, great. All because you have the law, uh, the embodiment of the knowledge of truth. Verse 21, you then who teach others, do you not teach yourself? Uh-oh, uh-oh, here comes the conviction. You who preach against stealing, do you steal? Those are rhetorical questions, meaning gotcha, Oh, teacher of the law, don't you even teach it yourself? Shouldn't you, what, practice what you preach? St. Jerome, about 250 A.D., and why is St. Jerome such a big deal? St. Jerome's a big deal because he's the one that took the Greek and the Hebrew, translated into Latin. Uh, the Catholics love St. Jerome. He created for us what we call the Latin Vulgate. You ever heard of that term? It's the Bible that's been translated from Greek and Hebrew into Latin. And so that's a big deal. He's the one who translated, said, listen, practice what you preach. It wasn't invented with your mom or your dad. It's a little older than that. He says, you teach, you Jews, you teach, but you won't be taught. You preach against stealing, but you steal. You're a bigot, and you steal. Well, they would, uh, they would go, because pagan, pagan um, um, temples, pagan temples, that's where they would stockpile the riches for that particular false god, and so the Jews just would go in and just take it all. You say, verse 22, that people should not commit adultery. Uh, uh, but you commit adultery? You abhor idols and you rob temples. Verse 23, you who boast in the law, you dishonor God by breaking the law? You, you know what I, what I feel is happening here is um, I felt like when Paul, he, he, you know, he he's kind of leads up to this, but he's really, he's really taking an ax to these Jewish people that are so self-righteous. And you know in the movies where like the lieutenant or somebody higher than that, maybe the general comes in to someone of a lesser rank and they've dishonored the corps, so to speak, and they go in and they take their, they take their, uh, their uh, strat, their, their stripes. and they... You know what I'm talking about? You ever seen that? It's like a Mr. Banks in Mary Poppins. I don't remember Mr. Banks in Mary Poppins, the banker, right? When he didn't, live up to the old crotchety guys at the table. They, they, they uh, cashiered him. That's the, the right word, cashier. Uh, because you used to be able to buy your commission, and when someone tore that off, you cashed out, and you could not recoup the money that you spent to get your commission. That's why it's called cashiering. So the official act of ripping someone's things off is called cashiering. Anyways, I digress. So so, but Mr. Banks, that's what I saw. Mr. Banks got cashiered. Mr. Banks, they took his little red carnation. Remember, they took his little red carnation off his, off his lapel and they just, 
<laughs> they threw it down. This is, what, this is what Paul is doing. This is what Paul is doing to the Jews. He's, he's really giving them what for. Verse 24, as it is written, God's name is blasphemed. God's name is blasphemed among the Gentiles. Why? Wait a second, how does that even compute? How is God's name blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you? I'll tell you why. If you wanna know how a Christian is supposed to act, ask an unsaved person. You want, these Jews, they were adulterers, they were robbing pagan temples, they were, they, they were teaching, but they weren't even taught themselves. And so as a testimony against themselves, the unbelievers blasphemed God because they witnessed unholy behavior in those who were supposed to be holy. That's what that sentence means. God was mocked because the Jews weren't doing... God gets blasphemed today because Christians don't do what they're supposed to do. They cuss and they lie and fly off the handle in rage. They manipulate, they get stoned, they get stupid, they sleep around, they gossip and they cheat. It is written, God's name is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. It all goes back to last week, chapter two, verse 13. For it is not those who hear the law who are righteous in God's sight, but those who do what? Say it, obey, obey the law who will be declared righteous. So two weeks ago, we had wrath on pagans and Romans. That was bad news. Last week, we had wrath on Christians. Yeah, that's you too. Remember the you too part of it all? And you, uh, that was bad news. This week, to the Jews, They got a dose of bad news just now, but here comes the hinge. Are you ready? The last five verses of this chapter is where we're gonna spend the lion's portion. So here's the context for what you're about to hear. If you don't understand circumcision on a spiritual plane, what I'm about to tell you five minutes from now is not gonna make much sense. All right, so... If you don't pay attention for the next five minutes, the rest of the sermon is pretty gonna, gonna be not, not as impactful for you. So you really gotta pay attention just for a second. We're gonna talk about circumcision. Circumcision wasn't a deal until Abraham. All right, so here's how it went down. God came to Abraham in Genesis chapter 15. He says, come out of your tent, look up at those stars. All those stars, it's gonna be like your children. That's how it's gonna be. That's the promise, you're going to Disney World. And then God whoosh, disappeared. And Abraham's like, what? What was that? I'm gonna have a bunch of children? I'm 76 years old. How am I gonna have a bunch of children? That's crazy. I'm married to this barren woman. 10 years go by, nothing happens. He's had this conversation with Sarah now, his wife. Sarah says, well, you know, let's just have you sleep with my servant, Hagar. Abraham says, all right, let's do it. Abraham sleep with Sarah, with Hagar. It was 10 years after the promise, by the way. He got tired of waiting. He sleeps with Hagar, has a son. That son's name is Ishmael. Ishmael, right? So it's all honky-dory. He thinks, Abraham, I think, maybe thinks it's the way it's supposed to be. Maybe God worked. Maybe God didn't work. There it is. I got a son. Where's, where's all the children, God. 13 years more, promise, 10 years, get in the timeline, Ishmael. 13 years later, God shows up again, says, mm, that's the mark there, Abraham. Are you with me? 23 years after the promise, 10 years after the first promise, he decided he was gonna force God's hand and birth this thing out of the flesh. God comes to him and says, now it's time to cut off the flesh, Abraham. I thought you were a man of faith. So you gotta cut the flesh. Wait a second. What is, where's the promise of Isaac? Where's Isaac coming off? No, no, no. Abraham doesn't know. We know the rest of the story. At this point, God just shows up and says, cut off the flesh. I'm done with this. Stop monkeying around. Circums, he's, not, he's 99 at this point. Circumcise yourself and circumcise your son Ishmael. 
We're cutting off the flesh right now. Then you'll sleep with your wife and she will give birth to a son you'll name him Isaac. 23 years later, do you think, I don't know, Abraham's the father of faith. What do you think Abraham, I don't know what I would do. Maybe, what? Really, I'm 99, God? Shouldn't you have done this back when I was 76? Now my wife is like dead twice over. This is really gonna happen? Yes. But first, before the promise arrives, be obedient. The book of Genesis is a long ways back. So after all this went down, God said, Abraham, he he said, circumcise yourself, circumcise your son. You're going to have another son. And Abraham fell down and did what? Laughed. So you're kidding me, right? God said, no, I'm serious here. Oh, incidentally, as a side note, I think it's interesting to note that that once this thing was born in the flesh, said uh, Ishmael, it wasn't until Ishmael became 13 years old that God showed up again, which incidentally is the age of legal masculinity, bar mitzvah, son of, meaning bar, like bar Jonah, bar means son of, mitzvah is, means law. So when a 13-year-old boy goes to bar mitzvah, bar mitzvah, that means you are now no longer obligated to your earthly father, you are obligated to your heavenly father. You are now a son, bar, of the law. You are a son of the law, you are bar mitzvah. That's what that means. So 13 years, Ishmael, is now legally responsible to God only, not to Abraham. Then God shows up again and says, now let's try this again. So here's what you're gonna do. Circumcise yourself with a flint knife. With a flint knife. With a rock. Yes, a very sharp rock. And as you read on all this, you know, a flint rock is actually a very sterile thing when you sharpen it because you're breaking off all the stuff that's on the outside and revealing the internal, most cleanest thing on the inside of that rock without impurities. Interesting. Not some rusty old bronze thing that grandpa's been carrying in his, in his you know, switchblade. No, brand new flint rock, circumcise yourself and your son, this thing called flesh, cut it all off. We're going to try this again. Abraham's response, it's, it, I have it actually circled in red with one, two, three, four, five, six stars. That's about as high as you can get in annotations in Pastor Eric's Bible. It says this in verse 23. I know you don't, probably don't have this, but in Genesis 17, 23, on that very day, Abraham took his son Ishmael and blah, 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 and circumcised himself and his son. That very day, that very day, right now. That very day, he did it. You get a word from the Lord, you do it. Some people, oh, I've been walking with the Lord for 35 years. That doesn't mean you're mature. It just means you've been, you've been persistent, right? Had, the length of time you've served the Lord has nothing to do with your maturity. You know what maturity in the spirit realm has to do with? How quickly you do what he tells you to do. I like hanging out with brand new believers sometimes. A lot of the times, A, because their prayers are awesome. And number two is when they hear God, they just do it. God said, boom, do it. Let me just say, they don't always hear right, and sometimes it causes a mess, but I'd much rather hang out with those people because 80% of the time they're right. It's much easier to guide a rock that's already tumbling down the hill than try to get an old mossy one that's been sitting there. We will, we will, we will not be moved, right? The old hymn of the church. Do something. Do something. Get on with the gospel. I'm a long way from circumcision, and I told you, it's an important hinge that we're about to swing on right here. But you don't, if you don't understand what circumcision it means to these Jewish people, then you've lost it. To be circumcised meant you are part of the chosen people. You are God's chosen people. Circumcision was the distinguishing mark of God on your life. So here we go, verse 25. 
Okay, circumcision is important to Jewish people. Here we go, verse 25. Circumcision has value if, if, the old if and but, these are important words, if you observe the law. But if you break the law, you become as though you've not been circumcised. Can you just hear the brake squeaking, scree- screeching? The Lord's, the Lord's telling them right here, and every one of them, you're lawbreakers. It's like you're not circumcised is what he just told them. Why are you glorying in your circumcision when you're not even doing the law? It's like you're not even circumcised. So then, verse 26, if those who are not circumcised, if they keep the law's requirement, Will they not then be regarded as those who have been circumcised? Of course, obviously the answer is yes. But if someone who is not a Jew follows the law, it's like they're circumcised. Verse 27, the one who is not circumcised physically and yet obeys the law will condemn you who, even though you have the law, the written code, and circumcision, You're like a lawbreaker. Just because you have the outward sign of belonging, you may not belong. So what are some of the outward signs that Christians could trust in? Hmm? Let's have some answers. Let's have a little conversation. Anyone, what is an outward sign that a Christian could put their hope in all the while their heart is not right? Going to church. Well, I go to Destiny Church. I go to Cherry Hills Baptist. I go to Westside. I go to Calvary Temple. Big deal. Whoop-de-ding. That's what what Paul's saying. Don't tell me you you go to synagogue every week. Who, Who else? Wearing a cross. I got that Jesus bumper sticker, baby. Really? I mean, look at some of the people in Hollywood that wear crosses. It's just jewelry. It's just jewelry. For you and me, it's more than that. But if you wear a cross, you got a cross tattoo. You got an I love Jesus tattoo. You got an ichthus. You got agape. You got, you got, you got, you got them all. You're all tattooed with Jesus. Doesn't mean anything. What else? You tithe because I give my money, because I give my money. God should let me in because I have paid my way. Hmm? Oh, I read the word every day. Great. I bet you the devil knows the word better than you do. So you really think you're going to trust on that one? What other, what other things do Christians trust in? How What? I'll pray for you, prayer. I pray every day. I pray every day. The Lord says your prayers are in vain if you have unforgiveness in your heart. Because I don't hear you. It's deaf. Heaven is brass for a man who mistreats his wife and then goes to his closet to pray. Heaven is brass to you. What else do we trust in? Pastors. Pastors, Or I am a pastor. Hey! Hey! You don't you know who I am? I'm a five-fold minister. I'm an apostle. I'm a prophet. I'm an evangelist. I'm a preacher. I'm a teacher. Yeah? Yeah? So what? Profe- I'm a professor in Bible school. I teach. Yeah, there's going to be professors in Bible school that go to hell. You know Why? They'll miss heaven by 12 inches. They'll miss heaven by 12 inches, the distance from your head to your heart. I'm water baptized. Oh, I worship. I have worship every morning in my my home. Do you worship God or you worship the music? If you worship the artist. Oh, I do good works. I feed the hungry. I help the homeless. Yeah, so do the tight. So do the, the local Lions Club. So do the local JCs. 
I take communion. It means nothing if the gospel hasn't tra- traveled the 12 inches from your head to your heart. You know, I could, I could go on, but I'll just read you what Jesus had to say to people like this. Matthew 15, verse seven. You awesome people, you awesome believers, you're just awesome. You're awesome. You're my favorite one. No. He says, you hypocrites. The prophet Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you back in Isaiah 23, or excuse me, 29, 13. Verse eight. These people honor me with their lips, but their what? Hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain. Their teachings are merely human rules. The point is this. Outward signs, and in, to, to, in Paul's world, when he's talking to the, to, the, to the Jews, to you and me in, what, in the list we've just enunciated, your circumcision, that outward keeping of the law, the things that we should do, we should tithe, we should pray, we should worship, we should, we should, we should. Those are things we should do. None of those were bad things. We should take communion. But if your trust is in that, in keeping a form without the substance, you're in the same category as these Jews. You're useless. The outward keeping of the law does not make you right standing with God. Verse 28. A person is not a Jew, we'll say believer. A person is not a believer, a Jew, who is one who outwardly, who only outwardly, nor is circumcised merely outward and physical. So here it is. Here's the hinge. Here's the spiritual swing right here in verse 29. No, uh-uh, none of that works. A person is a Jew, we'll say believer, a person is a Jew who is one inwardly and circumcision, underlined three times, five stars, circled in red, because circumcision should be circumcision of uh, the heart by the spirit, not by the written code. Such a person's praise is not from other people, but from God. Like ABC World News Tonight, breaking news. <laughs> Circumcision is of the heart is now required. No, that wasn't breaking news. They, tr- they, they treated it as breaking news, but it's not breaking news. In fact, it's really, really old news. Deuteronomy chapter 30, watch this. When all these blessings and cursings, remember Deuteronomy 28, you're blessed when you're in the field and blessing. If you do this, you're blessed. You do that, you're blessed. That's Deuteronomy 28. So let's go two more verses to Deuteronomy 30. When all these blessings and curses I have set before you come upon you and you take them to heart, whether the Lord your God uh, uh, disperses you among the nations and when you and your children return to the Lord your God and obey him with all your heart, with all of your soul, according to everything I command you. Verse six, here it is. The Lord your God will do what? Circumcise, what? Wait a second, this is in Deuteronomy? This is in the middle of the law? This is in the middle of the re-utterance of the law in Deuteronomy? This is where you find circumcision of the heart? This is not new news. This is old news. They just needed to be reminded. It has nothing to do with your outward form, Jew. It has nothing to do with how you think you keep the law, Christian. Oh, I pray. I, I, I'm a, I'm a, oh, I'm the first at church, and I'm the last to leave, and I'm, I'm doing this. Listen, all those are great things, but you cannot trust in that is what Paul is saying can't trust in that. Yes, do those things, but where is your trust? Where is your heart? Has your heart been circumcised? The Lord your God will circumcise your hearts, verse six, and the hearts of your descendants so that you may love him with all of your? That's why the Lord says in Proverbs 4, 23, above all else, guard your heart for everything you do flows from it. The heart is the hinge that will swing that doors of heaven opened or closed for you. Your heart is the hinge that will swing wide the heaven's gates or clamp them shut. God sends no one to hell. People send them, they choose. They choose to live a disobedient life, to have an uncircumcised heart. They play the game, they can wear the mask. They can wear the, the, the mask of a hypocrite. 
an ancient Roman Greek term for the actors used. That's what they were. They wore masks. They were hypocrites. They pretended to be somebody they weren't. Ancient actors known as hypocrites. Sobering thought for you and me. Right? This is why what the Lord said, listen, when he went to pick David, Cheryl, one of your favorite stories, I'm gonna look at, the, uh, God looks at the outward appearance, man looks at the outward appearance, but God judges the heart. Your heart is the hinge, write it down, that the doors of heaven swing on. The prophet reminds us in Jeremiah 4.4, 4, circumcise yourselves to the Lord, circumcise your hearts. Circumcise your hearts. It's not old news. I mean, it's not new news. It's old news. I'll tell you what. You tell me what's in your heart, and I'll tell you, I'll tell you what you live for. I'll tell you. You tell me the secret thoughts of your heart, we'll know exactly where you sit with God. That's why I can't judge it. We can see fruit, but if all we judge is fruit, listen, I know the scripture is there. I know we're supposed to judge people by their fruit, but if that's the only criteria in the plethora of criterion, we'll miss the mark and we'll, we'll actually allow people to continue to present themselves as righteous and holy simply based on what they do. And what that does, particularly in circles like this, in church circles, watch me, is that then if then what happens is if you can hide the condition of your heart better than someone else, you get promoted in the church. Do you understand what I just said? That's why outward acts cannot be the sole criteria for whether or not you're living a righteous life. We have to be able to determine one's position in the heart. And really only you can do that. Even your heart, the Bible says, is wicked beyond all these things. You gotta be able to trust the Lord. But who you are is not what you do on Sunday morning. Who you are is when you're all alone by yourself on a Friday night in a town where nobody knows you. And you don't think anybody's watching you. Scary, a little bit. This is why we, it helps us to run with other people, to stick with the herd, because we all know it's the little zebra dingle dang on back at the back that gets devoured. Yeah, do, 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 do. I don't need the herd. Boom. Right? So we run together. But when we run together, we must be willing to say and be transparent enough to say, you know what? I'm dealing with this. I'm going through this. I need to go to re re refiner's recovery or whatever. That's not some sort of horrible mark on your life. That's a sign of strength. Realizing, you know what? I am busted and disgusted. I'm a wretch. I am undone. Romans chapter one, Romans chapter two A. I, I, I cannot do any of this by myself. I need God. None of us here should present ever the fact that we are perfect, but we are forgiven. We are, we, we are forgiven. We're not perfect. That's why we're here. We realize we're broken. We realize we need help. We realize we need Jesus. We don't come here because we got our stuff together and then we finally get to come through the door. Woo, finally get to go to church because I didn't do that thing last week. No. This is a place for broken people who realize your circumcision means nothing. Your tithe, your church attendance means nothing. Your ichthus on the back of your car means nothing. All your children named after Bible characters means nothing. Zero, nada. How's your heart? Is the door of heaven open or closed based on the condition of your heart? And only you and God know that. I'm only here to remind you, only you and God know that. And if you're convicted today, that's not me. That's the Holy Spirit. It is the love of God that leads to repentance and the conviction of the Holy Spirit that might today just light a fire under you and say, I need to be independent of the powers of the work of the enemy within my life. What you think in your heart is who you are. As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. Proverbs 23, seven. There's a law of sowing and reaping and it has to do with this as well. You sow a thought, you reap an action. You sow an action, you reap a habit. You sow that habit, you're gonna reap a character and that character will shape your destiny. 
That's why it's important what goes on in your heart. So the question the Lord is asking us today is this. Have you cut off the Ishmael, the works of flesh in your life? Well, God gave me this promise and 10 years went by and it never came to pass, right? And so you went on with your life, you did your own thing, you slept with the Hagar and you produced this thing in your flesh called your career, called your family, called whatever, I'm not talking about deserting your family if you did something stupid like that, right? But God shows up, says, you know what? It didn't work out, did it? So here's the promise. We're gonna do this again. Here's how it all starts. You wanna reignite your passion with the Lord? You wanna make sure your heart is circumcised. You gotta cut off the things of the flesh in your life. Have I had Ishmael's? Have I tried to do things in my life? yes. Absolutely, rush to, like, okay, what am I supposed to do, God? Okay, got it. Okay, you stay here, God, I'll go do that, right? It's a little speedboat, little speedboat, little jet ski versus the barge. Let me tell you, you move a lot more grain with a barge than you do a jet ski. You might get there faster. If you want longevity, you go with other people, including the Holy Spirit, Right? So here's the question. Is there, is there the Ishmael, that false start, that thing that, gosh, I just kind of forced the Lord's hand on that, you know, and he can use it. He can still use it, but you say, it's time for a fresh start. I, I'm, I see that I need to get that thing out of my life, an attitude, a behavior, something that needs to be cut away. Uh, it's it's not a it's not a it's not a motif in scripture that's that's uncommon. <clears throat> Genesis six five. The Lord saw how great man's wickedness was on earth, how bad it had become, and that every inclination and the thoughts of his heart were evil at all time. What's that the predicate to? The great flood. He wasn't judging them on their actions. He said, "No, nah, their hearts all wicked." That's why the psalmist said in Psalm 51, Lord created me a, Jesus said it in his first sermon, Matthew 5, 8, blessed are the pure in heart. Why? They'll see God. Circumcise your heart. Stand with me this morning, please. I have, I'm not a big fan of the how-to's like how to, and here's the three rules and the five ways. But I have one for this. I have a way for you, I have a system whereby you can circumcise your heart. Here it is. Step one. It's the only step there is in the process. The end. Stop it. Stop. I can't. I know you can't. That's why you gotta stop it. You can't do it yourself. Can't do it yourself. You can have, let me tell you, there are people strong of mind, strong of will. Listen, I've been working, I'll I'll crack the door in my life here a little bit. I've been working on self-discipline in my life for a while, right? And then the Lord recently said, Eric, why are you working on self-discipline? That's crazy. Well, you know, it's it's one of the fruit of the Spirit. Fruit of the Spirit, self-discipline. Okay, I'm gonna be disciplined. More disciplined than I am already? Yes, more disciplined than I am already. I'm gonna be disciplined. I'm gonna be more disciplined. And, and, and the Lord says, well, this was recently then. He says, you miss the fact that those are fruit. Have you ever seen an apple tree work on making apples? <laughs> apple! No, it's just the fruit of being an ap- attached to an apple tree. Apple trees don't work at producing apples, Right? The fruit of the Spirit are the byproduct of what? Living a life with the Spirit, which means I'm broken, I'm busted and disgusted without the grace of God, I can't do this, I'm helpless. So if I want, and patience is another one, all the fruit of the Spirit he's been working on, but every time now, rather than I gotta be more patient, Lord, self-willpower, more, more, God says, no, no, all you have to do is just walk with me, make sure your heart is right with me, and then all this other stuff will work. 
See, so you've been trying to rectify, here's the word, you've been trying to rectify your own circumstance with your own self-will, with your own strong determination, with the outward thing, when God says, now, if you would just deal with the issue of your heart, if we can just, if we can just strip away all the noise and get just you and me for a minute, and we can talk about your heart condition and your idolatry in there and your pride in there and your greed in there and your lust in there and your... Maybe he's just talking to me. Maybe he's talking to you. If I can get you just quiet enough so you and I can have a heart conversation, says the Lord, you know what? We can take care of this stuff. And the other stuff, it'll follow. The fruit, we'll know them. But that's, don't worry about that. Don't worry about that. Apples don't worry about being birthed. You just gotta be grafted into the vine, right? This is not about me uh, bringing you to a place. It's about you coming to a place, okay? I can simply present the word, and you've got to say, you know what? I'm going to build an altar right here where I'm at. I'm going to come down front. I'm going to turn and kneel. I'm going to get away from my family, my friends, and that's, that's totally acceptable, and you're just going to have a conversation with the Lord. It's not going to be so much about you singing the words on the screen. It's about the Lord and you having a heart conversation because, ladies and gentlemen, that's the only hinge that matters. The only hinge that matters. Today, we focus not on our actions, but we focus on our heart. This is not on what you do, it's about what is on the inside. Greed, harsh, a spirit of unrest, covetedness, anger, lust. Well, that's not me. You didn't list the one. 1 John 1, 8 says, if we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. I want him to work on me the rest of my life. I don't want to coast weak. I don't want to coast for a month. And if you've been coasting, the only way you keep speed up if you're coasting is going down downhill stop coasting stop coasting on your wife's coattails on your husband's coattails on your grandma's coattails step up be a man be the woman God's called you to be swing wide the gates of heaven it happens when your heart is right with him